Welcome to the Upper Pen Podcast. I'm here with Kale Plawman again, and today we are talking about the Tower of Somnus series, of which Foundations and Chiwaki Nights are out, correct? Correct. And there's one more that's coming out soon, right? Correct. I'm on like chapter 15, 16, 17-ish of uh, book four, but uh, book three is done. I just need to finish the final edits. <laughs> I feel like uh, these books have been pushed along so quick because Dakota and Daniel Kraut are having their kid, right? So they're trying to get a lot of stuff pushed out. Um, a lot of it was just when things were getting done. Um, and my first trilogy with Mountaindale entered the pipeline kind of all at once because the trilogy was done. Um, Somnus entered the pipeline... I, I think it was actually at this point is when I, you know, started on it where I was two books in. And then the third book is when we started speeding up. But the third book also finished about six months ago, something like five, six months, something like that. Um, so it, it, it's a process to get through all of the betas, editing, um, blurbs marketing <laughs> like i really like the writing part but uh at some point i realized that the writing part is maybe half the jobs so. which is annoying because it is a huge part <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh it's nice that dakota opened up um mountaindale press so that like there's a place for lit rpg authors that don't have to self-publish <laughs> yeah i mean that's my thing is i i am I, I, ha I have a lot of friends who swear by self-publishing and uh, I, I have nothing wrong with that, more power to them. I just have a day job that's eating up like 40 hours a week if it's a, if it's a nice week. Um, and uh, because of that, I just, you know, I, I can write. I like writing. I can do the editing. I have to do the editing. Uh, but like marketing, making, you know, a lot of that stuff, it, it, it hiring editors hiring cover artists um i did a little bit of that when i was just solely serializing and it was, it's a nightmare to stay on top of I, I i wouldn't even want to try like where do you go to find a good cover artist you know like i search deviant art i guess if this well, is 2007 <laughs> oh god no you I mean that, that that's actually literally one of the best places is because people have like uh like yeah. showcases of their stuff but you have to be careful because um, if you're using commercial, like the art for commercial publication, um, a lot of times the brushes that will, people will oh, be using to put studio paint will actually be um, personal use only. And anything for commercial, you have to make sure that the brushes being used are okay. You have to make sure that the font being used is okay. Uh -huh. um, and and, and it, it's just all of this stuff where it's so, so, so easy. Or if like there's like, part of a stock image that's being used and if you don't have the rights to that stock image um so like you know the prices we end up paying for covers are like significantly more than if like you're just a person you're like hey i have a cool original character i want something to do art <laughs> for me like that can be done a lot cheaper we're jerks to our artists and i apologize to all of our artists but because we make them like build it from the ground up so that we don't end up getting into you know copyright trouble later <laughs> It would just be one of those things, you know, I would end up there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I love these two books so Good. much, so much. Um, when you told me about them, when we talked last time, I was like, I'm stoked. I want a cyberpunk lit RPG. And here it is. Like I was, it's so good. I, well, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I, part of the other thing is I, I, I really like cyberpunk as a genre, and a lot of this series was, um, everyone kept saying cyberpunk 2077, but I'm going to date myself here. This was cyberpunk 2020, <laughs> which I grew up playing in like rec centers and everything, like, it, you know, in high school. And so I, I have a whole bunch of really great memories of playing cyberpunk 2020. I literally never even bought cyberpunk 2077, so that's so much of the flavor. But my problem with all of that is that it's always Seattle. It's always Neo-Tokyo. It's always Toronto. You never actually have cyberpunk anywhere else. And I'm like, I'm from the Midwest. You're getting Chicago cyberpunk. <laughs> I, I was just reading a couple of reviews um, on the Audible page and somebody was like, oh my gosh, it's set in my hometown. Oh. 
<laughs> well, well, there's kind of a, a little sort of Easter egg thing for those of us who are down here. I think you're probably a little bit north to be taking trips to Schaumburg. Yeah. Um, so Schaumburg's big thing for everyone who isn't in the like Chicago, uh, Chicagoville area or whatever is um, it's got a giant Ikea in it. And people will take multi-hour trips to go to this Ikea. And that's actually what Ike Holdings is, is it's an arcology built on top of an Ikea. Because if there's anywhere where I'm going to be building my like dystopian tower where I force my employees slaves to live in, Ikea seems about right for this. So, so I was trying to figure out what department store that sells furniture would be big enough to hold all of these people. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen one. <laughs> now that you oh, mentioned well, Ikea though. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Obviously the idea is that there were a lot of floors built on top of it because I think that one's like three stories or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that I, I very much like Ikea, but Ikea, like, especially like, you know, after your like 20th minute lost in there as you're following the various arrows and you don't know if you're ever going to see daylight again. It, 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 it It's at least a little bit of a minor inspiration for my cyberpunk dystopias. I definitely went to Ikea in Minneapolis and all I bought was a fermented peach drink and like a towel for the kitchen. That's it. Because I don't need a whole new bedroom set. <laughs> Well, my thing is that, like, my wife is the one who gets, like, the actual furniture stuff. I just always come out of there with dumb knickknacks where I'm, like, <laughs> convinced I'm going to use them. So for the longest time, I had these little, like, lanterns that you could put tea candles in so for, so for, like, going out camping. And they and the, and the cool thing is they had these, like, uh, punched holes in the top of it. So they would, like, uh, put designs on, like, the roof of your, like, tent or whatever. I've used those a grand total of zero times. But that's exactly <laughs> the sort of thing that, like, I go to Ikea and I'm like, wow, this is so kitschy and cool and I'm totally going to use this. Never touched again. It makes perfect sense because the whole book is, like, capitalism on steroids. So <laughs> <laughs> just makes the most sense. <laughs> um. So, Okay. You get a little bit of how the aliens kind of interact with humans in the very first book, but how do humans get to this, this only mega corporation, my like, like government? Um, so I left it kind of vague in the books because I think most people didn't want, you know, to deal with too much of the origin story there. I have something written up that basically involves, um, I think, oil shocks and inflation. And again, uh, you know, <laughs> that was before all of this stuff happened. But the, like, you know, if it, the general idea behind a lot of cyberpunk is just that um, corporations and corporate affiliation becomes more important. Well, state affiliation, like, you know, the United States, whatever, becomes less important. And so that's just the idea is that this kept happening. And then, um, I, I have a list of like, I think the 12 or 13, me, you know, large mega corporations already written up somewhere, but um, it, the various like regional hubs turned into like corporate towns run by one corporation and almost became countries or like fiefdoms with each of them kind of specializing in one or two sort of things. Like, so for example, the place I have in England, I believe spe specializes in like telecom. In the Midwestern one is farming, pharmaceuticals, things like that. Um, uh, and then like information technology and communication is Neosign, which is out of LA. Okay. And so, it, and so that's what it is. There's like these geographical areas where there are a whole bunch of subdivisions, all of which are, you know, owned via like multiple shell corporations by the same like mother corporation. But then there's also just kind of like areas of specialty and they all like hate each other and periodically literally go to war with each other, but they all also trade with each other because that's how you make money. Right. And um, they all have like this, these deals with each other that you kind of touch on every now and again. Um, one of my favorite things is anytime they they say um, Ike Holdings, they have to say a wholly owned subsidiary of GrowCorp. <laughs> it's the name. Yeah. <laughs> And and even like when Cat, the main character, doesn't say it, she often gets corrected. Oh no, no, we have to be precise. <laughs> no, no, it, it, that, that's an important part of this. <laughs> How is this the important part? 
<sighs> and I mean, that's one of the things that I, I mean, like this book had a lot of my frustrations with uh, corporate life and a lot of things built into it. And one of them is you just have random idiosyncratic factors that are considered very important and then like you you know you as an employee on the ground level are like uh why do we care about this why does anyone care about this and, and it, it's important it turns out it's more important than you are like that this you know specific procedure that doesn't make sense is happening like for example like um i tried to get into a little bit of that with the sort of like cable cancellation um spiel in book two with the debt guy yeah. um where there, 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 there are very much these procedures and I'm not going to be the one to change the procedures because that would end up with like everything landing on my head. And then like, that's kind of how it is. It's like everyone's keeping their head down and you just kind of build, build up this sort of like Baroque series of this is what is done and this is what is not done as part of corporate culture. And um, so like by day I'm an attorney and a lot of times I have people come to me who are like well yeah this is this is the law right because this is what everyone the corporation does and I'm like that is not at all the law you know like that might be what your corporation's doing you might think that you have these certain protections but that's just what your corporation has decided to do for good or for ill and you just have that sort of like built up culture like that and I thought that that was an important part of getting the like sugar gloss on your dystopia it works so well because it it's really like the hoity-toity people who always add that to and they're like you know better than that you indentured servitude <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> um i love i do love that cat always mentions that her debt includes her birth yep. and um the hospitals associated with that yeah uh that's uh there are various other parts of my professional life that are in that and that's one of the things that um I, I deal with when I'm dealing with child support cases is they uh they they bill your birthing expenses to you um via child support. And you know, and I get why they do it, but it's also one of those things that's just kind of like, oh man. <laughs> so you took it to its log logical conclusion, right? Like yeah. <laughs> if we like, follow the to, steps. <laughs> like the the goal for this was to have something that on paper could be meritocratic. But in practice, there's no way whatsoever it would come within like a mile of meritocratic. And so I was trying to go for a bit of a company town feel. And I, I think that like, you know, starting it out to the point where like, well, we've been billing you since the, you know, literally before your birth. And by the time you can actually start working a part-time job, you already owe more credits than you're going to earn in your life as just sort of like a, you're so far behind, why even try? Yeah. And that's kind of the spending limit thing too. You really get that a lot of the citizens have just kind of like given up too. Like Kat's mom just doesn't even try to get herself out of debt. Um, and I feel like that's the case with a lot of people I know that you just live in debt. That's just how you live. Well, I mean, that's the thing. And, and, and it's, this is, again, a lawyer thing. But one of the things I learned is that if someone owes you 500 to $1,000, they'll pay you back and you'll work on it someone owes you $15,000 and that money's gone. Like it's, they're, they're just, they're just so far down the hole at that point that yeah. they're spending funny money and then, you know, they're, 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 they just don't care. And I, I get it. I completely get it. But I, I, I just, I, I don't know. It's one of those feelings that I wanted to make sure to like infuse into the story because like, you know, if you're earning 10 credits a day and you owe 8,000 credits at that point, I mean, I wouldn't care about paying it down. All I would care about is like, can I get a little bit more enjoyment out of this crappy life before eventually my back gives out? <laughs> I'm just surprised that Kat went for a way to actually pay it down instead of just abandoning it. I guess she has her mom and her sister, so she can't really abandon anything. But like, I would I would go full Xander and just like leave <laughs> and just start yeah. a gang. <laughs> um, so starting a gang is basically the only other option. Um, yeah. one, of, one of the things that I tried to get into a little bit is that as bad as being a debt slave is, um, it's not that much better in the shell. It's not that much better when you're outside of the corporate enclaves. Cause like, if you run a gang, it's fine. But like, unless you're like seriously in a gang, like everyone else is like 
doesn't have running water half the time they're in poverty you're at the mercy of gangs like you know your life expectancy is probably 30 like it's it's just bad <laughs> okay so there's all of that going on and then there is the um company mandated school that she goes to at the very beginning of book one and i love that it's an open secret that only the rich kids will be valedictorian yeah. um, <laughs> like oh yeah she did so well on her tests she showed up maybe <laughs> yeah no exactly like no i mean the rich kids got to compete amongst themselves like you know they <laughs> like they could theoretically one up each other it's just everyone else like you you just know better than to let your scores be higher than theirs well, Kat even tried, and I, I get the feeling there was just fudging, you know? Yeah. Oh. He can just fudge. <laughs> um, but, so Kat gets into the Tower of Somnus, which is the game, um, but it's not really a game. It's more than that, right? Yeah. So it's like a place where all these different alien races can come and meet together and kind of settle differences. <laughs> Uh, yeah, meet, cooperate, settle differences, um, grow, learn, shoot each other. And then there's us piddly little humans that are relegated to the outside because we're awful, like we are. <laughs> I, like, the inspiration for that was, I, I forget which Star Trek episode it was, but there was one where uh picard and the next generation was going to a planet and they were trying to bring the planet in and the more they were doing the first contact the more they realized they're just not a good fit mm -hmm. and the end of the episode is then is these people being like well we can give you like these resources in this dilithium and and, and, and picard's just like yeah we'll be back in a hundred years and may maybe things will be a little better then and just skedaddles and that was kind of the vibe i wanted for that with the like at some point, it's not about money. You need, to, you know, you need to grow up on your own, and we can't make you grow up. Yeah, and unless we have a way of getting out to them, like the issue solves itself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so she gets into the tower via Arnold, her friend, who is a rich kid, giving yeah. her a subscription that he got in the game. So it like drops like loot yeah. every now and again um arnold is awful <laughs> yeah yeah i'm so glad that he was not uh part of her party for very long uh yeah so the actual inspiration from him which is again a, a work thing is <laughs> i um i do a lot of work with uh domestic violence victims and one of the things you run into a lot is you have very smart, intelligent, on top of it people that will have a blind spot for a partner where, you know, it'll be someone who like is more in control of their life in every way possible than me. Other than that, they'll just, you know, they'll have someone where it's like, well, he or she doesn't let me have a credit card. He or she checks my phone. And you just run into this. You're just like, oh my God, what are you doing? And that's kind of what I wanted to go through is from the first person perspective well, I guess third person omniscient, but still, um, but like from Kat's perspective, sort of like being in one of those situations where the red flags start coming up, but it's your friend, you have a crush on him. So you're kind of like, you know, he's just under stress. It's, you don't have to worry about it. And, it's, it. and I wanted to walk them through her dismissing the red flags where you as the reader can see them hopefully you as the reader can also see why she's dismissing them and i i tried to make sure that the problem resolved itself quickly enough because i can understand why it'd be frustrating for the readers if it stuck with too long but i did want to establish him as kind of like the this is something that if anyone isn't careful they could walk into like anyone so i was just so glad that you actually acknowledged that he was not a good person because so many books that I read that are aimed at young adults are like really abusive relationships. And then I just don't get the appeal. And I, I just, I get so frustrated and I'm like, well, you, you're actually setting up a role model relationship for young people and they think it's okay when their partner belittles them or critiques them all the time. And or, I was just like, 
you, you have extreme jealousy. Like yeah. that's such a classic one in YA fiction that um, you you have the, like there needs to be this absolute jealousy or he doesn't really care about you. And I'm like, that's toxic for him and for the, oh my God, that's like, like why? <laughs> I keep seeing that, um, what is it called? I don't know. It's some fan fiction that was written about Harry Styles that was turned into a movie. Oh, I and... don't know the name, but I'm aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, so that movie is just gaslighting the girl the entire time. And he's such an awful human. And I was like, you need to you need to walk away, like before you started talking to him. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and that's the thing, is like I I feel like we have we do have a lot of bad role models for people, and that's certainly a problem. And but I mean that's the other thing is like that's one way to make it so your audience is teens only because most adults when they see that yeah. are just like no i dated a guy or girl like that and i'm good with not reading this again i guess that does kind of make sense like i probably would have been like okay it was wasn't great but you know that's their problem yeah <laughs> so i was just glad that Kat realized pretty quickly that he was not great for her, even though it took her almost dying in the tower to do it or to really get to the point where she couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. I mean, one of these days I'm going to get around to writing a book where there are like healthy relationships that are handled in healthy ways. But like, yeah, like that was kind of the sub theme of book two of Blessed Time was just you need to let go and you're holding everyone back by not hold, by, by, by doing that. And I'm like, you know, like, and then like, uh, vice race pride. I very clearly like, you know, I had someone where like, she could be a love interest, but we're not going to do this. This is a book about fighting space orcs and space elves, whatever. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's good. I really like her relationship with Doric and Kalik though. Like, it's such a friendly, sweet relationship that they have. I I always, in my story built storytelling, go back to, in, like, the two people I kind of use as my canons for storytelling are Lindsay Ellis and Red Letter Media. And at one point, Red Letter Media was trying to explain why one Star Trek movie was better than the other. And they said that the key, Star Trek, Star Wars. And they said that the key point was that Star Wars is about fun people that you like doing fun things and the story matters, but unless you hit that first beat, no matter how great your overarching plot is, it's going to be a slog. And that's kind of what I was going for is the real world is dark enough that I, I, I can't just pull people through the muck full time in the real world. So I wanted there to be fun people doing fun things. And so there, you know, there's still action. There's, you know, all, you know, like there are still plot arcs in the tower, but I want the characters to be fun. I want you to be rooting for them and I want you to enjoy their time on camera. And and that's kind of what I was going for is people that you, you I hope you like. <laughs> Give me one second. I'm going to close my door again. Sorry, since the uh, summer, my door has expanded and uh, it won't close all the way. My dogs just push it open. Yep. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but so Kalik and Doric, though, they're hilarious, but they're great ways to get information through to the reader. Like, I love Doric explaining, like, how certain creatures or certain species in the tower works. Uh, it's really great to, like, information dump without being too heavy. Yeah, no, so, oh, yeah, you haven't gotten to my favorite Doric. That, that's book three. So I, there, there's some stuff with Doric that I hope you'll like in book three. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the key to Doric is that he is the, well, they, sorry. I, I, we're, my we're, apologies, yeah. No, no, no. We're in book four in my head where um, oh, as there's going to be a, a transition because uh, they come of age. Okay. So I'm, I, I, it's even harder for me to keep the, the like all of that straight because 
where I'm writing Doric is a he. <laughs> it's it's hard because like they imply that they are going to be a he when they come of age so every yeah. now and again i'm like he but it, it's not the way it is so doric is mask coded <laughs> yeah that, that, that's true um but no so the uh the thing the thing with doric is i really wanted doric to be kind of a warrior monk but in a kind of nerdy scholar sort of way so on one hand doric I think it's heavily implied, but I'll make it explicit, is clearly the best fighter in the party. Like, yeah. 1v1, there is no way anyone is beating Doric, but at the same time, Doric is just overly enthusiastic and a gigantic nerd about learning anything they can about, like, the tower, about Cat's world, about Cat, and I, I just wanted that, like, zest and enthusiasm to be kind of a counterpoint between uh, that and them being a murder machine. <laughs> So it's really funny because um, the three of them will go into a dungeon together and uh, Doric has everything planned out. He's like, oh, yeah, I did. I did a bunch of research. I know what's going to be in here. And then Cleek's like, yeah, I'm going to go kill the things. <laughs> yeah. Please stop talking. <laughs> well, the, the the other thing with Cleek is, and I think I think you're as far as that is that, is that Cleek is actually very intelligent, too. I, I think they, I, I forget if they were an engineer or a math, some, something of that sort. I think he's a mathematician. Uh, yeah, mathematician. Yeah. But the idea is that uh, Kalik, Kalik thinks too much during the day. So he uh, he want, just wants to break things at night, which is fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love in the book or in book two, uh, these, there's spoilers in this. So I will make sure to put a little spoiler heading at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. But um, I love that the first part of the book they're stuck in like a desert world and then the very end they get to water and Kalik's like ah this is the best and Doric's puking over the side of the boat <laughs> yeah <laughs> it just like sums up their relationship so perfectly <laughs> yeah no no like they're 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 dysfunctional but very good friends and I really wanted that to show <laughs> yeah it does it feels like friendships that I have you know like someone is at the bar and they're clearly drinking and you're currently passed out in the corner like yeah i get it yeah. <laughs> so i love their relationships and then um in the real world xander is such a strange character <laughs> i like him and i don't like him all the time like it's always like a mix because he's always really funny but then he's like he's one of those guys that knows he's tough you know yeah. <laughs> yeah xander i always meant xander to be an anti-hero slash father figure so like he's not a great person like he he knows that cat would probably be, be a little bit squeamish with the like darker sides of what he does so he doesn't really have her do it but like he definitely has had to get his hands dirty to get where he is and uh there's no questioning about that but at the same time yeah he's like you know he's funny he's charming he's kind of the pirate with the heart of gold character um but yeah also yeah he he has a little bit higher of an opinion of himself than is maybe healthy <laughs> It's just funny the way he is. And then his wife's usually just like ignoring him and doing the actual like work that yeah. needs to get done. Yes, yeah, so exactly. I appreciate it. It's funny. And I love him as her father figure. It's so great because he like takes her under his wing, even when she's not sure that that's the life she wants. <laughs> well, Xander knew it was the, the life she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> he was there. He knew. <laughs> um. Let's see. So I really thought you were going to kill Whippoorwill when she got shot. I was like, no, you can't kill her. You already killed somebody in the last book. And then she survives. And I was like, oh, shit. Uh, if she doesn't die here, um, something bad is going to happen because that's the way the world works, apparently. <laughs> And then the something bad happened, Kale. It happened, and I was in a drive-through, and I was crying. <sighs> you can't that, do this to me. <laughs> there are two scenes that I've actually cried while writing, and that was one of them. Um, What's the other like, one. <laughs> well, the other one's in a in a book that one of these days I'll probably market. It was um, 
I might have mentioned this, but like when I was teaching myself how to write, I did sort of project books where I would focus oh. on like one aspect of it. And that was the book where I was focusing on like um, family and like emotional connections. And I had a, something similar where there was a character I really liked that uh, it was their time, uh, according to the plot arc. And Xander was one of those ones where like, usually when it's someone's time to go, I, 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 like I, I I don't have a problem with writing them out. Um, Xander was one where I was like, is there a way I can make this work? Is there? A, but I was like, no. It, it, like it's clearly where the story was going. Like I, I, it would be me like getting cold feet at the last second, which is almost what happened. But it, but it had to happen. I could see that you um, maybe wanted to keep him alive because he doesn't die right away. Uh, mm -hmm. He lingers, and then it looks like he's getting better, and then he's really just not. Um, yeah. And then you do it twice because you make us repeat it when she's when everybody else is watching her footage. Yeah. And I was like, I I'm gonna strangle you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that that part wasn't fun to write. I think it is one of my best written like two chapter periods, but also it wasn't fun to write. <laughs> <laughs> It was so good. It was so good. It made me cry. So good job, but I'm mad at you. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Book three comes out in September or is it October? I believe it's November because um, it was originally going to be October, but um, I'm releasing the first book in another series in October. So it got bumped to November. Is the other book your one with Athon? Yes. Okay. I've been looking. It hasn't been out. So, you know, it was creeping. Just letting you yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it'll <fun>. get out. <laughs> <laughs> I've been having a lot of fun with the Tower of Somnus, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I always love little chats like this so that I can yell at you about your meanness and your greatness. Good job. I, I, I try not to be too mean to my characters, but so, sometimes, like, espe like, especially in a world where you were, you know, it, it's not swords, there's not, like, there's healing, but it doesn't work well. Like, yeah. it's dangerous, and if you don't dodge quick enough, people die. I really loved that Cat learns a healing spell, but it, like, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll handle cuts, bruises, you know, maybe if you can set a broken bone. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really low level, so, like, that makes sense. It's just, it's helpful, but to a point you're like, ah, well, if somebody's really dying, shit. <laughs> I mean, one of one of the inspirations from her is, um, one of my all-time favorite animes is uh, Darker Than Black. Um, and Darker Than Black has this interesting thing where the main character has superpowers, but one of the reveals as you're going through it is, unlike everyone else, he gained them, like, halfway through the story. Um, and it's just him, but it turns out that he was just like, well, I'm just really good at martial arts, so I'm going to fight amongst all these other superpowered people, and my 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 superpower is just being really good. And that's kind of what I was, like, kind of going with with Kat, is like, yes, there are powers, and yes, they're helpful, and she would be nowhere near as good as she is without them, but at the same time, it really comes down to she's just very good with a knife. I think you even mentioned that in... Um maybe it's Doric who mentions that because she's good in the real world, she can succeed in the tower. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I'm really excited for book three and four. Apparently I'm glad that yeah. there's more than just three. <laughs> uh, yeah. This I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is six or nine. It's going to be at least six. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. Then, then I won't expect a conclusion immediately. Uh, there, there, there will not be a conclusion immediately, no. <laughs> I always get kind of worried. I'm like, I love this world. You can't take it away from me. And and then it's like a duology. And <laughs> I'm no. like, don't do it. <laughs> no, I, I very much like the worlds for both uh, Dream of Wings and Flame, which is the Aethon one that's coming out, and Somnus. And my kind of goal for the foreseeable future is to kind of just alternate books between them. Sounds good. Well, I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope everybody who watches has already read The Tower of Somnus, books one and two, because otherwise this will... I mean, you'll enjoy the ride. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thanks, and have a great day.